Welcome to the Lancaster University China Centre's research seminar series. My name is Andrew Chubb, British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Politics, Philosophy and Religion at Lancaster University. Um, and as a host today, uh, it's my duty to inform everyone, first of all, that the seminar is being recorded. Um, and also that you are welcome to post your questions in the chat uh, at any time. There will also be plenty of time at the end of Professor Lucia's presentation uh, for you to be able to interact and ask your questions directly, as I believe is enabled by this new webinar format. I'll be able to allow people to unmute and ask your questions uh, to the expert directly. Um, now, our speaker today is a noted expert on global production networks and digitalization of manufacturing in electronics, automotives, and other industries. Uh, his many books and papers also cover industrial relations in China more broadly. He got his PhD from the University of Frankfurt in Germany, where since 1999, he's worked as a senior research fellow for the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research. He's had appointments as a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, the East West Center in Hawaii, Renmin University in Beijing and elsewhere, and is now the director of the Technology and Industry Research Center at the Institute of Public Policy at South China University of Technology in Guangzhou. So there's no one better qualified to give this critical assessment of China's industrial internet. So we're very, very pleased that he can be with us today. And without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Professor Boy Lutje. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for the nice introduction. And good evening, everybody from Guangzhou. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, give this talk tonight, uh, especially since um, the University of Lancaster is also a partner university of my university here, the South China University of Technology. And uh, looking into the audience, the digital audience, I see uh, one old friend, David Tyfield, who uh, from Lancaster, who has also been here in Guangzhou many times for his research on uh, on on mobility. Uh, we are uh, our uh, organization here is a public private think tank, the Institute for Public Policy, um, which is uh, uh, it's adjunct to the university, but it's privately funded. And we are a uh, think tank, it's called Joku by Chinese uh, laws and regulations, which means we are uh, registered under uh, very high authorities of the government, of the central government. And we are specifically asked to give uh, our good advice on uh, some of the policy issues in China that have not been that are not uh, regularly uh, discussed in the or addressed in the public uh, discourse. Um, the industrial internet is not necessarily an issue of uh, this of, of this type because uh, it is uh, it is a core uh, uh, industrial policy program in China. Uh, following the uh, or in the wake of the Made in China 2025 program, uh, which has been seen as uh, such a big threat by many people in the world uh, and uh, has been subject to constant discussions about uh, uh, China's uh, China's quest for control of uh, uh, key technologies. The industrial internet is much less publicized, but it is public in China, and it is a core program of uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the current for China's industrial policy. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, a little bit about the context, what the industrial internet of things is, uh, and how it relates to the broader context of what is called the fourth industrial revolution, or in German. Industry 4.0, Industry 4.0. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about the pathways of the transformation of industrial chains and value chains that we observe here in China as part of this uh, development of industrial Internet of Things. And then I will also talk about uh, uh, work and labor and labor policies. And this is probably the part that's also not so much in the public discourse here in China. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, an issue that uh, has to be addressed. 
And taking this uh, from a research project, a, a long-term research project over almost three years uh, that we uh, conduct uh, with together with our partners at the uh, Berlin Social Science Center uh, and the Weizenbaum Institute for the Digital Society, which is something like the key think tank in Germany uh, for uh, digitalization and the social and uh, political implications. Uh, and the research project has been funded by uh, the German uh, um, Hans Böckler Foundation, which is the uh, which is a think tank and the uh, scientific found academic foundation of the German trade unions. Uh, some of the research questions are presented here. I'm not going to read them out now because I'll talk about it at, at length. But the key question is whether with all this, uh, uh, um, with all the, uh, the, the um, transformation of uh, manufacturing towards internet-based and platform-based uh, technologies and configurations of networks and also value chains, uh, whether the model of platform capitalism that we uh, know from uh, from from mobility services, from uh, uh, from Facebook, from social media, from uh, Alibaba, or uh, here in China, um, the food delivery industry, Meituan, whether this kind of this kind of uh, uh, industrial model can also will also penetrate uh, manufacturing. Um, this is something we can study here in China. It has not really happened or taken place in uh, most parts of Europe and also not in the United States. I will explain this a little bit, but China is kind of a laboratory for this uh, for these new uh, developments. So uh, I will talk about uh, uh, industry uh, for zero uh, first. Uh, you have probably heard about this, and you have seen these uh, such 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 pictures about uh, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, most of these materials they come out of the uh, German Academy of uh, uh, Technology, Akatech, and some other think tanks, or and it was initially produced and pioneered by the. Uh, German uh, Federation of, uh, of, of the Federation of the German Machinery Industry. Uh, and it has been a, the whole concept has been uh, maybe not not a big success in, in, in real terms. We we'll talk about this in a moment, but certainly as a as a uh, as a, uh, uh, um, a a slogan and as a, uh, as a as a public relations concept, this is normally not the strength of uh, German industry, but uh, in this case, it has been very uh, successful, especially in China, since China took the um, idea of Industry 4.0 as uh, the lead uh, uh, model or theme for its uh, Made in China 2025 program in uh, 2015. Um, and uh, there have been many, many books uh, published on this uh, topic here in China. Um, and uh, but the uh, uh, the the um, the analysis really had never has been has been uh, uh, um, questioned or developed in a more critical perspective of what this notion of the fourth industrial revolution uh, really means. Uh, and uh, especially, that's our view. Uh, it we, uh, it has not it has not questioned the. Uh, the massive technological determinism that we find behind these 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 uh, uh, these these pictures uh, that uh, explain to us that uh, now the industrial revolution number four is based on what the German engineers call cyber physical systems, uh, which integrate the factory and the digital networks into a seamless world uh, and um, make all kinds of wonders happening. Uh, it may, those were the promises, uh, it would replace uh, um, the, the human worker by robots at a large scale. Uh, it would uh, bring this total integration of factory floor and digital networks. It would, uh, uh, um, it, it would 
bring us bring customized manufacturing to the to the lowest level batch size one losgröße one eins this is the uh, this is the big uh, the big uh, slogan for this sorry and uh, it would bring a lot of new business models and uh, uh, of course a grand revi revival of manufacturing especially of the german machinery industry um, if we look at these at these uh, at these promises and try to take a balance sheet now, just ten years after this uh, revolution was proclaimed, uh, the balance is very mixed, and we have to see to say that most of these uh, most of the problems of this uh, of this um, uh, uh, of the, this concept and the development of the recent years uh, have not really been. Um, well understood in Germany, there is really still no public discussion about it, and pretty much the same is uh, uh, is true for uh, China. Um, we still have what we see um, when we try to see this the balance sheet in Germany or in Europe and in China. Uh, the first thing we see that uh, in many industries mass manufacturing has already been highly automated. Uh, like in the car industry or also manufacturing of computers or not to talk about chips. Uh, and in this uh, in this sense, um, uh, there was no real push forward for automation in these industries. Um, integration of factories on uh, with B, uh, business to customer and business to business platforms and all these new forms. This has developed very fast in China, not so fast in Europe. Uh, then there was a the big, the big promise of breaking up the what's called the data silos inside the factories and the corporations. So the many, the coexistence of many unrelated and unstandardized data systems, uh, especially at the shop floor, uh, which are always difficult to integrate and which for all the promises that have been made on from by software, big software vendors like SAP or so on enterprise management systems. This integration ne never, never had happened. Uh, and so people are also looking at the um, at the big, the very big uh, cloud providers and mega platforms now as uh, the um, uh, the the players to use the to 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 um, uh, to uh, to solve this problem, for instance, Volkswagen, as you may have heard, has given its entire uh, uh, management of production uh, data and the supply chain to Amazon Web Services to put all this on one global proud, uh, cloud system. Uh, something is a deal that has risen a lot of uh, 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 critical questions in 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 Germany. So. Uh, what we see, there is a lot. There is a lot of. There has been a lot of different things happening at the same time. But it's not really. It's not really the great, the grand push in uh, automation, and it has not been. This is very important. Not been the big push towards the uh, manless or the workerless factory, and that's uh, what I. This is the main characteristic, uh, and this is exactly the point where the industrial internet in China in particular, starts from. Um, what is um, important to understand uh, that when we want to answer the question, do we see something like platform capitalism into manufacturing, uh, we see that um, the integration of factories with the internet and thereby in very general terms of non-digital and digital knowledge is a very complex thing and often much more difficult to uh, and definitely much more difficult to achieve than integration of uh, of uh, 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 consumer data or financial data or whatever in, uh, in consumer platforms or social networks. Um, and China's industrial internet strategy pretty much starts from from this from this perception. Uh, it was proclaimed uh, in uh, since about 2018 in several government uh, guidelines. Um, it followed, as I said, the Made in China 2025 program. Uh, 
but it does not explicitly relate to it because, as you may know, Made in China 2025 as a political uh, projection or slogan was uh, was uh, quietly taken off the table in China uh, around 2018 in the wake of the uh, of the beginning U.S. trade and technology war against China. Uh, nobody or many people here do not uh, do not understand why this happened, but um, um, whatever the reason, um, there were. Uh, uh, there, there was a there was a shift also in the in the in the rhetoric and also in the uh, way how things are presented publicly from from factory automation to uh, 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 industrial internet, uh, especially and at that point the, the platforms uh, the big e-commerce platforms like Alibaba in particular. They were coming in as the big uh, saviors, we can say, of Chinese industry uh, in the face of uh, all the assaults that came from the US against uh, Huawei, against uh, uh, chip companies, against uh, uh, TikTok and many others. Um, and uh, uh, this changed uh, or this was this the the, the, the policy was uh, was then to promote uh, uh, in uh, rapidly industrial internet um, pilot projects since 2008 18 uh, today we have about 200 different uh, IOT platforms in China maybe even 300 now um, but this does not include all the uh, 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 the 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 e-commerce platforms that uh, play a big role in the uh, in reorganizing manufacturing and also in it does not include the uh, uh, industrial internet platforms or platform based manufacturing uh, uh, schemes of uh, foreign multinationals or um, joint ventures so uh, the environment for this is quite large, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, it's it's it cannot uh, 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 neither Europe nor the U.S. can can um, compare with this, and it has also become a, the industrial internet has also become a key field for uh, what is called indigenous innovation in China under the 14th five-year plan and also for that concept of uh, dual circulation of which you still uh, certainly have heard um, and uh, the uh, it's also one of the, the five key new infrastructures uh, for into which uh, the Chinese government is now uh, uh, investing a lot of money um, in the wake of the uh, of the slowdown of the of the crisis uh, induced by COVID-19. And also, it is uh, part of the the, this, the, the very current uh, political debates on the regulations of platforms, and uh, it's related to the whole concept of common prosperity. Um, and we'll talk about this a little later, or in the end of the, this uh, uh, this this presentation, what this means and what it does not mean, what it doesn't mean, and what it could mean. So. Um, May I just ask in between, is everyone comfortable hearing me uh, speaking with my with a, um, with a with a sound and with a uh, technical so far, quality? So far, so good. Yeah. Okay, then uh, I try to go on this way. So, uh, as I said. Our research on this subject is mainly focusing or is starting from the um, perspective of value chains or also production networks, global production networks, uh, um, and um, also, of course, in the local arena and clustering. So this is more from the industrial, from the political economy and from also from an industrial sociology point of view, uh, which normally has not been uh, has not been uh, uh, applied to this uh, to this debate so much, particularly the point of view of value chains, uh, especially in the German dis discussion. We have a lot of uh, 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 engineering literature and business uh, business um, 
analysis that talks about single companies and certain certain factories and certain success stories, but never uh, answers the question, do we have some kind of uh, new configurations of value chains and are there, what are the potentials for industrial upgrading and uh, um, how can uh, existing hierarchies uh, be broken up? This is pretty much the question of uh, our research. Um, the key area thing to understand is that the industrial internet is not um, a, a lot about um, automating manufacturers, uh, 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 manufacturing uh, facilities or factories uh, um, alone. It is a part of industrial order automation, but automation and digitalization also systematically are not the same thing. Um, and but it's not mainly about robots. That's the big. That's the big. Uh, uh, a misunderstanding also about of the the whole or this derives from the from the whole uh, industry for zero debate and also from the way it was implemented in China. There was this famous uh, slogan "Qi Jiu Huan Zhan," which means the robot replaces the human or the man or the the woman in the factory. That was the main the main target, uh, but as we can say, it uh, never happened. Or at least at the full uh, in in this uh, in 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 the in the projected dimensions. The key problem of the industrial, the starting point of the industrial uh, internet is uh, the internet, the uh, networking of this or the yeah the networking of different uh, actors uh, and uh, uh, parts uh, facilities and segments of the production process under unified uh, uh, softwares uh, that um, uh, use uh, that are based on, on platforms and that you heavily use cloud computing and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the so it's basically and this is something this is a lesson that has well or this is a point that has been well understood in China, but I think not so much in Europe yet. It is basically about building infrastructure building new infrastructures for uh, for for the integration of uh, of production and of course logistics and planning and development and everything um, on the basis of publicly available infrastructure and the key of this is 5G and we all know that China is very advanced in 5, in 5G we all know that uh, Europe and especially the United States is pretty backward in this field and we know that uh, Western governments, the, the American, the British in, uh, in particular, are uh, doing everything to keep uh, Chinese players out of this uh, industry. Uh, so we can expect that this uh, development will uh, will remain very slow in Europe and it will continue to be fast in China. And uh, what we uh, see for, uh, what we see from a, a, a more sociological perspective of uh, how production is organized and reorganized. The key problem of the industrial internet is that uh, there a lot of knowledge has to be integrated from different sources into platform based uh, software concepts or platforms that can be owned by different actors that can be big, large mega platforms like Alibaba or like uh, Amazon, or it can also be it can be smaller ones and it can also be uh, owned by local governments or they can be owned by local industry associations, whatever. But the key thing is that many that all the major segments of uh, the of, of social production have to be integrated. So it, we're talking about new uh, configurations of the social division of labor that includes knowledge from many sources. That's primarily, of course, the automation of production, which is the classical domain of uh, uh, the knowledge of knowledge by major major uh, industrial automation companies. It not includes uh, uh, management of the of industrial supply chains. It includes e-commerce and advanced distribution. It includes enterprise and manufacturing software, which is called, usually called enterprise price resource planning systems, ERP, or manufacturing execution systems, MES. 
It includes cloud, cloud computing. It includes the software and operation of platforms. Uh, that's normally what the, what the big platform providers are good at. It includes the public telecom infrastructure and the equipment. And it, of course, includes the organization of work and thereby also uh, at the training and development of the workforce at all levels of the production process and, and distribution. The key thing to understand and for policy making is there's no single company in the world that can integrate the complete chain of knowledge in all these fields. Uh, may, when we look back into the era of the well of, of late Fordism, uh, uh, if you want, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, still in the 90s, some very large uh, vertically integrated um, uh, equipment manufacturers and uh, electronics companies, they were close to uh, a position to have this wide uh, 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 um, spectrum of industrial knowledge, like the old, like the telecommunications companies, for instance, Siemens in Germany, which is still a major player in industrial automation, also not industrial internet. Um, but in the process of, uh, uh, of of restructuring and of the, especially under the financial driven, driven and controlled by the financial markets in the in the 1990s and 2000s, these big industrial conglomerates usually became uh, split up and they had a constantly concentrated certain areas of what was called then core businesses and core competencies. Uh, in China, this is uh, pretty much the same or it reflects uh, if reflects the, uh, this, this development. Uh, there's also China does not have any uh, major industrial company that could even uh, think of being uh, a, a, a fully integrated player in this field. So we're talking of uh, a diverse spectrum of companies and we are also talking of diverse spectrums of, uh, uh, of, of development, of pathways of, uh, of development, of trajectories. Um, in the research uh, on, this, uh, on this topic, we have suggested a four major trajectories of transformation that's production driven those are this is where the lead companies are typically large production companies and uh, uh, automation uh, industrial automation companies typically we mentioned it already the big germ uh, uh, machinery makers and uh, electronics companies Siemens for instance or Bosch um, that's the dominant pattern in the whole world of industry for zero and um, um, uh, industrial, also industrial internet today. Um, and there, but there are uh, not, there are also radically different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, we talk about distribution driven development of industrial platforms. This is where uh, the um, the development of production platforms is starts from and is driven from by large uh, internet companies. Uh, the best example for this is the uh, the Taobao factory or the Taobao platform concept uh, in uh, of of Alibaba in China. Um, again, this is a very Chinese uh, uh, way and very typical because uh, in the West, the Western platforms, Amazon in particular, is not really really uh, uh, pushing into manufacturing. And there are a couple of other uh, um, uh, ways, equipment sharing and integration, the control of, of equipment uh, as a, the starting point for platforms. For instance, we find this in the construction industry where we have these big in China, the big players, uh, Sani and uh, 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 XCMG or called Shigong, the big construction equipment makers who also developed a lot of uh, software systems and a lot of uh, 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 digital knowledge uh, to uh, control the equipment on the uh, in on construction sites on the side of their customer and then also uh, get into the whole business of managing the construction site including including the workforce including the uh, the working hours and the secure safety things um, this is a very, uh, this is strategically a very important uh, approach, um, and uh, we also have uh, as the number four 
uh, we have customization as a as a key as a key driver of uh, the uh, of of platform development. Typically in China, they are the the, the household uh, equipment makers, the big ones, HiR and uh, Mydea or Midea. Uh, they are they are starting from they started from this angle as they try to customize their their uh, 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 household equipment and established platforms and communication with um, customers. So these, this is a rough, uh, this is a is a rough and uh, um, uh, uh, well um, typology of approaches. We are working with this. We're not quite satisfied at the end of the day, but it's at least uh, one way to uh, understand the uh, differentiations of the. Uh, empirical world in this uh, in this uh, field. Um, just a few examples. Uh, I talked about Alibaba uh, and Alibaba is certainly one of the big drivers of manufacturing transformation. Um, uh, primarily through um, its e-commerce platform Taobao uh, and uh, the other related uh, platforms. And you know, we all know Alibaba had a has a has a background in um, uh, uh, or started as a business to business uh, uh, platform, and accumulated a lot of knowledge about uh, how manufacturers uh, interact with uh, with each other and with their buyers, um, and with uh, their with uh, its Taobao system, um, they basically provide. Uh, uh, Taobao is an is an e-commerce platform, just like like Amazon. But uh, Alibaba provides certain certain policies and certain uh, uh, support measures for villages, mostly industrial villages along along the eastern coast. We have many of them in Guangzhou here, for instance, uh, to that focus on certain products that are typically sold to. How about customers? Certain, mostly light, uh, light, light consumer industries, light consumer goods, uh, garment in particular. And uh, the when a village has uh, let has uh, about 50 platforms, uh, sales platforms in one village, it qualifies as a. Taobao village, and then it receives all kind of support from uh, Taobao. Uh, and also from the government. Many governments are very proud of it. Uh, and this this uh, um, concentration of many manufacturing, low tech manufacturing companies under one big under big local platforms has the effect of massively uh, 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 um, uh, increasing competition, price competition in particular. We have uh, studied this this in detail here. I cannot uh, give all all those details here, but this itself has a is a very is a very impressive way of uh, reorganizing the um, production chain and also the value chain at the local level within the clusters and the uh, organize the division of labor among the companies through uh, just e-commerce, just putting them on the platform, and then Alibaba has all kinds of. Uh, other devices and schemes or platforms, uh, also platforms where the data of these suppliers are um, uh, uh, analyzed and uh, uh, presented to um, uh, customers, and you can you can use those uh, special platforms to um, search suppliers for certain. Um, uh, uh, products or um, components or subcomponents, uh, like in the garment industry, you can search for providers of zippers or of uh, of buttons or of um, uh, uh, dyes or whatever. Uh, and all this, all this will be will be uh, 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 networked into in 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 real time. Uh, and there's a couple of more, and this is also a a, a uh, a, an example of how to integrate low tech companies into under high tech net, networks. So this is what I said. Uh, this is digitalization, but it's not automation. So these companies, the, the, the work process in these companies almost does not change. It's still mostly manual labor and often the workshops get even smaller than uh, before. 
but uh, everything is digitalized and uh, everything is uh, visible uh, in this way. Um, Alibaba recently also pushed some other smart factory models, uh, one in, uh, uh, in in Hangzhou and also in, in the neighboring Jiangsu provinces that, that would uh, uh, provide uh, contract manufacturing services for, um, for, for small and medium sized companies, especially in the garment industry with a lot of customization. Um, so different, different approaches. Uh, and of course, driven by the logic of platform capitalism, which means uh, uh, invest in, in new fields wherever you can uh, get venture capital for this and uh, try to make it to, to, to build some kind of a monopoly there in that in that field. This is uh, in some ways it has been success in some areas have been successful and some not, but it's definitely a transformative uh, force in manufacturing. So if we uh, try to summarize the results of the uh, chain that did this research on transformation of value chains. Um, we can see, uh, I mentioned this already, China has an infrastructure oriented approach to manufacturing modernization. Uh, no other major industrial country in the world has this. Uh, we have a very high diversity of platforms and business models. Uh, about 280 projects right now in China. We have a very broad-based industrial uh, policy approach, and as I tried to explain already, wide spectrum of participants and uh, uh, a lot of knowledge integration from diverse companies uh, in uh, from a diverse spectrum of companies along the along the production chains and platforms, and. Uh, on the whole, uh, we can say, and that's one of the, it's a preliminary answer to the key research project a question of our project, that the role of mega platforms like Alibaba finally uh, remains limited. And it may mainly, up to now, it mainly uh, had taken place, uh, this kind of the Taobao village phenomenon, as we call it, is mainly confined to uh, consumer industries and light industries, and it still has to penetrate uh, uh, more capital intensive and more um, knowledge intensive industries. And it's definitely a big question whether this will uh, ever happen. Uh, just some uh, some some uh, uh, examples, and then I want to move on to the to the labor issues uh, because uh, I realize we have already 30 minutes of time. Uh, used up. Um, those are China designs uh, what they call the cross industry platforms, the top platforms uh, uh, under the, the national um, uh, development uh, uh, program. Uh, they are designed, every, they're selected every year. And you find when you go, uh, when you look at the company names, uh, you find the major, um, you find major industrial uh, players there. Most of them from the private sector, uh, and it includes, of course, uh, uh, companies like Foxconn, Taiwanese, but one of the big bearers of industrial know-how know and knowledge in China on the mainland China. And of course, it includes uh, Alibaba and also in some other projects, uh, Tencent. And uh, this is a, a, a compilation of major cluster projects in uh, in our province here in Guangdong, um, which is, is a similar mechanism. Uh, they get these these model platforms. They get uh, selected by the by the provincial government. What is of interest here, and that's uh, that's really in our perspective, the important thing and the important learning that's that's happening in this in this field. There are specialized or very specialized prop, uh, uh, platforms um, set up by uh, multiple by coalitions of multiple players and local governments for uh, specific industries and um, uh, uh, fields. For instance, customized home industry. This is used to be the furniture industry, but it's in, it integrates furniture making with all kinds of uh, 
a custom made uh, design for furnitures and also the, the installation services. Uh, there are specialized platforms for injection molding for toys and household appliances uh, and uh, industrial equipment life cycle management. Mold making is very important. We're talking of metal, of, of uh, um, 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 die cast molding for, for instance, uh, um, uh, um, uh, home appliance industries or for the car industry or for uh, um, for the for for cell phone uh, uh, frames, uh, and you see when you go to this uh, this part here, when you know a little bit the uh, the geography of South China, then you will you will know that uh, each of these uh, cities that are listed here, they are home to large or very large clusters of these particular industries and related industries. So this way of uh, 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 development is very, it's very infrastructure oriented, but it's also cluster oriented. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the challenges for uh, labor. I realize we have maybe, uh, I'm pretty much running out of time already. Um, but and I really would like to leave some kind for uh, time for the discussion. So let me just touch a few main points. Uh, the main point by, about all these things uh, related to the discussion on industry for zero made in China 2025, everything that's digitalization, we can say manuf manufacturing work still matters, uh, which means uh, the um, elimination of uh, of manual labor from the factories um, has not happened uh, at a real large scale uh, in China in the recent um, five or ten years. So most of the projections by whoever Fry and Osborne or all the prophets of the digital age from this perspective are wrong we have to say empirically wrong uh, and you can find a lot of lot of figures that uh, in some of the industries here in the in the Pearl River Delta there have been massive reductions of, uh, of of labor in the course of digitalization or the deployment of robots but this has remain, remained very segmented and very punctual for instance one uh, area where a lot of uh, Manual labor has been displaced as the manufacturing of uh, of molds and frames for cell phones. This is a this is a process you can typically automate or completely automate and also make made big gains in, in, in quality. And this is now required by the major uh, phone makers, whether it's Apple or Huawei or uh, uh, any contract manufacturer. But those are very limited. Uh, um, uh, 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 spots or parts of the industrial production system, also limited in certain towns. This industry is uh, in special town in particular townships in Dongguan. Uh, and when you look at the whole labor of the, the overall labor market effect, uh, this may have cost some some uh, uh, 50,000 jobs or something in uh, in those areas in, in Dongguan. But Dongguan has more than 5 million manufacturing workers. So uh, uh, related to this, this is not really, really uh, uh, Ji Huan Ran, um, robot replaces uh, men. But of course, the auto, uh, automation has increased and digitalization has increased uh, de-skilling. And we're now uh, looking at uh, much more automated ways of, uh, of uh, uh, de-skilling, so to speak. I cannot go into the uh, into the details now. Um, and one other aspect is uh, uh, when we talk about these Taobao villages, we can see that the fragmentation and the precarization of labor has even been increased because as these many shops are, uh, many small shops are in, in, uh, 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 in, in heavy heavy price competition. Of course, they will also try to save on, on, on labor. And there's a lot of back uh, towards development towards cottage industries. And those are the typical industrial villages, this one here in Guangzhou, where uh, um, the workers are still hired by phone 
and uh, uh, you can get a job and a and a room and a and a and some kind of a dormitory at the same time. And it's like it's, uh, those are informal labor markets. And this, uh, according to our research, has been growing. It's very difficult to quantify it, but the phenomenon in itself has been growing in recent years. Um, just uh, to, uh, uh, there are many other trends of rationalization to describe. Uh, what is important is that uh, the middle ground of um, manufacturing of um, in terms of capital intensity and technology intensity for in especially in the metal industries in the large metal industries like like uh, household appliances or the huge supply the car supply industry in china or here in guangdong automation has been much more gradual and there has really no such thing like a fourth industrial revolution in the last uh, five or ten years um and uh, the companies have been automating uh, constantly, but uh, often with um, more traditional technologies. Uh, it's uh, it, often it's just mechanization, uh, then maybe automation, but uh, it's uh, certainly not digitalization or uh, industry for zero. What we have found in the couple of studies that we did on car suppliers is uh, biggest problem is that in of course, these uh, these these uh, uh, the, the automation reduces uh, labor and reduces the number of jobs in the in the factories. But uh, the workforce often does not really shrink because uh, demand is uh, growing in many in in many areas. Uh, and the main, but the main, and there, there are also opportunities for upgrading of work and reskilling because uh, in these in automated environments, the, of the workers often do uh, perform more tasks and they supervise not just one machine, but a number of machines. But uh, as a rule, they have to acquire skills for this and they have to acquire all kinds of certificates, but as a rule, uh, they don't get more money. And this is as what we know from the industrial relations research uh, in China that the wage systems and the uh, uh, and the skill system are um, highly decoupled or un unrelated. And this is mainly because uh, uh, wage standardization is very weak. And this is uh, uh, mostly or the basic reason for that is the absence or the weakness of uh, collective bargaining. So, uh, and this of course uh, defines uh, defines the major problem uh, for the factories and for China uh, to deal with uh, the uh, impact of the industrial uh, internet. Uh, the problem, the key problem still is the labor uh, system. There have been made uh, some uh, uh, important uh, steps forward in some provinces. Guangdong is also one where at least uh, collective bargaining has been uh, established as a legal norm system for private industry uh, some years ago in the in the in the wake of several uh, big labor conflicts we we had here. But this is still very, very weak, uh, and of course, it's far away from uh, uh, from uh, really dealing with questions of automation at the shop floor or something like this. Uh, which also means, and that is my that uh, I want to just uh, take this as my um, uh, 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 my my last remark on these on these topics. Uh, the topic of our common prosperity as we know it now uh, cannot be achieved without uh, substantial institutional reform uh, in the organization of factories, in the skill system, in the system of vocational training and also worker representation, including collective bargaining. So uh, in Germany, we have another um, famous slogan in this context. It's about work for zero, Arbeit für Null. Uh, and that's the uh, that's the the the, uh, the formula uh, under which employers and companies deal about uh, the future of work and the upgrading of work. Uh, this uh, is uh, also 
a very popular notion in China when you use it here, but of course uh, it would need the, a lot of institutional reform that we do not see at this point. I will, uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, sorry for overrunning my time limit, but I hope everyone could, uh, could follow and uh, uh, did not get bored. Uh, I hope we have uh, some more time left for um, questions and uh, answers. Thank you very much um, to everybody. Terrific, thanks, Professor. Um, no, I think we, we booked in for an hour, but we can spill over if you're able to stay around. Um, I've just put a message in the chat for the audience. Uh, they're welcome to type questions into the chat or alternatively raise your hand and I can bring you in. Um, a question from me, first of all, would be, um, are you seeing any evidence of industrial internet practices or policies or industrial internet knowledge spreading from China to other industrial centers. Uh, you're obviously intimately uh, familiar with the situation in Germany, uh, probably elsewhere in the EU. Um, do you see any evidence that China is in any way influencing the world in, 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 in the adoption of these types of policies and practices? You want me to answer this right away or you take I, I've, uh, I've also also got a, uh, a hand up from Professor Jing Han Zeng, um, so I will bring him in too. You should be able to uh, hang on. I think you should be able to unmute now, Jing Han. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Good. OK, so thank you for the presentation. Glad that you can join uh, this uh, the lecture series. Um, I do find, I mean, uh, recently uh, the Chinese uh, Standardization Administration released a national strategy for standardization, and much of it is about how China can set up the future standards for Internet of Things. Um, and I wonder, I mean, do you think that this is going to have an impact on the global um, technological standard on, in, uh, on industry uh, internet, or will this bring a challenge to a field which used to be dominated by Germany and Japan. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think uh, this is kind of related. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, put it simple, what is, is the, lear the world learning something from China or not? And will China re uh, uh, control this, uh, this field? Um, the answer is, uh, um, in the first part, knowledge transfer from China uh, of internet practices uh, into other parts of the world. Not so much at this moment, because uh, the um, transformation of the factories this is still a very, very local uh, phenomenon, even in global corporations. But there are some cases, for instance, um, uh, one case is uh, a major car maker from Germany. I cannot name it, but you may uh, uh, guess uh, who it is. Um, they have uh, they have set up um, a global system, a global system with a big American platform provider uh, to run their whole supply chain and production system. Um, and in the uh, now in the joint ventures in China, they find number one we cannot work with Amazon as a platform provider because Amazon can, is not a cloud provider in China and under Chinese law, uh, local cloud providers have to be, have to be uh, uh, used as uh, partners. And of course, this is here in, it, this is Alibaba or this is Huawei or this is uh, Tencent. Uh, within that corporation that has uh, produced uh, big clashes inside the management between the, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, part of the of the company or the Chinese joint ventures and the and uh, uh, the, uh, the the global leadership. And the thing is now the company has been forced to go to a multi cloud platform model and use a completely different uh, software for its global platform concept. 
which cannot be taken from Amazon. It doesn't work. Many people in Germany and Europe are very happy about this because uh, they prefer to work with Chinese cloud providers or a diverse spectrum of cloud providers, and they also relate, uh, rate the, the knowledge of uh, uh, the big three here in China and Huawei in particular as, uh, as, as very profound in this field. Um, this is one, uh, one way of, uh, well, hard learning, uh, hard technological learning in this, uh, in, in this, in this world. There are other, a lot of other interesting, uh, things from the car industry. For instance, you see here in some factories, you see factory workers, skilled factory workers, uh, in the maintenance department of maybe very complex machinery, uh, in the, in the press shop or wherever, uh, use self-designed programs and chat groups on WeChat to program maintenance maintenance uh, uh, um, uh, schedules, to program group work, to order parts and all these things, just to uh, organize a communication among the workers at the shop floor. This is something uh, very special. It could never happen in uh, in, in uh, Western companies. In you in Germany, I know it would definitely be forbidden in most companies because programming is not for the workers. Programming is for the IT department or uh, for whomever. Um, but these things are happening in China too. Yeah. So uh, that's. Um, but this is, of course, on the background of the just of this the huge the the, the widespread ability and the, the 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 huge popularity of this kind of platform software. Um, but um, why not? So that's one example that may show us how differentiated the knowledge transfer um, uh, goes. Uh, the other way around, talking about uh, whether China steals knowledge from. Uh, Germany or Europe or whomever in key technology areas. The one big point of concern was about five years ago when uh, Midea here in China, in Shunde, near, near, nearby here, the big household equipment maker, bought up uh, KUKA, the main robot maker from Germany uh, and the top provider, the top uh, provider of robots to the auto industry. That provoked, provoked a, big, uh, a big public debate and the German government under the Social Democratic Party at that time even tried to try to prevent this. Uh, it did not go through because the union inside KUKA finally uh, uh, agreed to the deal because they thought uh, the offer from the Chinese from Midea was much better than the competing offer from a US hedge fund that was on the table. Um, the situation right now is uh, there has never been any job lost in Germany due to this uh, due to this deal. Uh, they are paid a lot, and many people here think they paid too much. Uh, but KUKA is not doing well because uh, it cannot really sell many robots in China because they are too expensive, ex except for the car industry. Uh, where KUKA has its uh, its its um, its its key market, uh, the projected move into uh, 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 lighter industry and also into less capital intensive industries and in the, also into logistics and e-commerce has not happened. And Midea was not very very uh, very uh, 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 smart in, uh, in in doing this. Uh, plus. Uh, Right now, Medea is becoming a big player in the industrial internet, uh, and but uh, they are not uh, in, in industrial software. But they themselves say we cannot use our KUKA equipment in these in these in our marketing and business concepts because the stuff is too expensive. Yeah. So, and this is of course when you when you rate this or when you rate the, the discussions of five years ago about China stealing technology and all this uh, uh, against this reality, it's just uh, uh, kind of ridiculous. Yeah, uh, The thing, of course, in all these questions is, and this also relates to the to the other question, the impact of, of, of standards. Uh, I said this before, no one company in the world can control the whole chain of knowledge. 
and also not even the Chinese government can control the whole chain of knowledge, not even the Communist Party of China. Uh, so there needs to be some kind of uh, of cooperation and there can be no decoupling. Yeah? And in this in this case, uh, in, in the case of the industrial Internet, uh, of course, standards are extremely important. That's the key thing, and it's very much related to 5G standardization. Uh, and we know that China is very strong in this field and, the Ch and China is uh, really uh, considering standardization as strategic. And this is something uh, uh, or a sense of uh, a strategic vision that has been lost and uh, in, in many in many uh, 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 segments of uh, industry in the in in, in the West, uh, and uh, um, of course, against this background, China is playing a big role in these international standardization uh, committees, and no one, in fact, can standardize technology in the industrial internet field, and also in many other related fields of 5G without China or without the key Chinese players. I mean, Huawei owns some 70 or 80 percent of, uh, of all the patents in 5G in the world. So uh, again, there is no decoupling in this field. A uh, question from David Tyfield, and there are two more in the chat, which uh, if you can see it, um, I'll let you field them directly yourself. Otherwise, I can read them out. But uh, David, you're free to come in. Hi, boys. Great to see you and uh, yeah. thank you for an excellent talk. Um, yeah, I've, I've got two sort of related questions, really. Um, and what you were just saying about the, the impossibility of decoupling in this uh, space as well is very interesting. Um, so the first thing is about um, the, whatever industry 4.0 is becoming this industrial internet of things. Um, you talk about the infrastructural approach taken in China and, and how this is um, the, the key of uh, networking different actors is well understood in China. I just wondered if you could reflect on why, why China gets it and other countries don't. Um, and uh, um, related to that, um, uh, the, the, the flip side of that, you were saying that um, China is obviously in the lead in 5G uh, and there's this complicated politics of 5G around Huawei in particular. Um, it, it sounds to me, and I just wanted if you could correct uh, this picture which I have in my head, um, it sounds to me like this is therefore um, a, a very difficult situation um, for, for other places um, because uh, whether there are legitimate or not concerns about Huawei, they're, they're not about to be placated anytime soon, um, or indeed any Chinese company in the 5G space. Uh, and yet, in order to be able to move to this infrastructural approach, they actually need 5G, which they are very far behind on. Um, so th there's not much, they, it's, they're sort of high and dry, as it were. Uh, and then just finally, you know, that relating to your point about there being no possibility of decoupling in this space, that feels to me like the uh, the recipe for what you could call a, a sort of um, a long standing into the future unhappy marriage um, between uh, between China and you know the, the established uh, Western uh, tech sectors uh, that they they sort of need each other. Um, but they don't like working with each other or they do like working with each other, but they can't say so or whatever. But it's not it's not uh, it's not straightforward. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on those points. Um, I have many thoughts about it, and it's uh, of course, it's uh, the um, and starting from your starting from your uh, first remark. Uh, why is China so strong in building infrastructure and uh, why can a, an infrastructural approach to industrial transformation be so uh, uh, um, strong here? Uh, I think that's the, the major thing is uh, that China still has a major, uh, or China never 
deregulated the telecommunication system in the way that the West has done it. We have a, uh, I mean, it's it's a very different different situation from the U.S. and Britain and also Europe some uh, 30 or 40 years ago in the 80s and 90s when Mrs. Thatcher uh, sold out British Telecom and uh, uh, AT&T was uh, divested in the in the USA. Uh, of course. The, uh, the, the, the state-based approach uh, in China has primarily served a uh, developing country, developing economy, which may almost started from zero in, a, in, a, in advanced telecommunications. Uh, and uh, um, this approach has worked very, very well. I mean, this is it's just the old the wisdom of everything we know from infrastructure building. Uh, in the West, it needs large scale investment, it needs integration, it needs that it needs standard and also it needs business models uh, that uh, uh, under which the um, uh, the uh, the uh, a growing number of consumers and users of these infrastructures fund uh, or provide the funds or uh, repay the funds for the enormous investment. Yeah, and the West this has been achieved under the under the public utility regulation that we had in the 19 uh, since the 1930s or 40s in the US or in the in the government owned uh, state and postal uh, post and telecommunication uh, state monopolies in the 19 uh, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s uh, and uh, right now today we are in a situation that the latecomer china has completely overtaken all the major economies in this field and is very strong yeah and china is now applying applying this approach to industrial modernization yeah and the whole thing what i uh, try to explain in the in, in in my in my presentation all these these, uh, these 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 trial platforms and these uh, uh, local initiatives and the large the, um, national cross industry platforms and all these things basically serve the goal to bring as many companies on the cloud as the uh, uh, as it said as, as the slogan here is in China Shan Yun uh, bring any all the enterprises the companies on the cloud to organize their manufacturing from the cloud or under the under the cloud based uh, 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 um, uh, software um, and it's very and this is and it, it, and it's very important to understand so generally this is a at first this is a program to generate to generate demand for 5g because 5G basically is not a consumer technology. Uh, it's not very attractive on cell phones. Maybe TikTok someday or ByteDance will, will uh, create some new video download services or what on the basis of 5G that we don't know yet. But the main thing is the Internet of Things, is the connection of uh, cars, uh, power stations, uh, charging systems, or also factories. Uh, on uh, uh, mobile or by mobile infrastructure. And so uh, the whole program of uh, uh, in industrial internet is basically a way of to generate demand for 5G. And that's a very straightforward strategy. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's not, uh, well, it's, uh, it's it's very clear and uh, it's not not objectionable in, in in this way and you can also see if you look at my slides in detail maybe later after the after the, the presentation you can see that in these local projects the big infrastructure providers uh china mobile china unicom or china telecom play a big role in some areas here in Dongguan, for instance china Unicom is the main integrator of or the main host for the local uh, industrial uh, internet alliance. Yeah, um, and the equipment makers, Huawei in particular, they they play a similar role. Yeah, so they provide know-how to the companies, or they also uh, uh, are financially involved to create uh, new models of of of. of uh, um, uh, platform-based manufacturing 
Yeah. So and in this in this sense, uh, I think the West can learn a lot from China in terms of industrial policy. And I mean, we we definitely need industrial policy in Europe, and you also need it in Britain, whether you're part of it or part of Europe or not. Uh, and uh, this needs some broad-based approaches, and uh, this needs also standards, uh, and this needs in the, and it needs global cooperation. Yeah, and politically, I would urge I would urge uh, uh, the European Union uh, and uh, also the, uh, the, the the relevant governments to promote cooperation in China also as a way of uh, of uh, um, or as a as a counter model to decoupling as it has been advanced by the former US administration and it's the same thing now under under Biden when they talk about supply chain security and supply chain resilience about all these things this is basically about kicking China out of the supply chains which in fact is not possible yeah neither in the chip industry nor uh, nor for the suppliers of Walmart. Time for two last questions from the chat. Uh, one from Liu Song Yang, who asks about the opportunities and challenges uh, to the Internet of Things or the, the industrial Internet, I should say, uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. And Justice Nam, uh, PhD fellow at Lancaster University China Center who asks about the role of semiconductors in the industrial internet. Yes, direct answer, very important. Uh, and this is one of the key areas where China tries to develop its own uh, critical mass for independent innovation systems. Yeah. So of course the 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 very very advanced chips are used for um, uh, industrial internet, um, and China and the Chinese chip makers and Huawei in particular they are not getting the technology from the U.S. Yeah, today I don't know whether you have read it. The U.S. government is now asking the major chip foundries, including TSMC and some Samsung, uh, to provide their customer and manufacturing data to the US government uh, about their multi-billion contracts with uh, whatever Apple or Hewlett Packard or whomever they 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 uh, uh, make the chips for yeah I mean this is a, a real a real this program of, uh, of of industrial espionage uh, and China's China's uh, China's approach in this field, um, also promoted by Huawei, we have to say this, is create as many alternative ecosystems of innovation based on 5G and on the industry Internet of Things uh, as we can. And as we shift and those we're talking about uh, industrial Internet, we're talking about mobility, we're talking about uh, um, uh, uh, power systems, smart grid, smart mobility, smart cities, smart airports, smart container harbors, and whatever, uh, where you have these these uh, Huawei likes to call the vertical infrastructures, uh, sub infrastructures uh, with lots of um, lots of. Uh, 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 um, industrial uh, players participating and they can in these contexts you can create the knowledge for the software and you can also create new knowledge for uh, new designs of chips uh, that um, on the long term may be become China specific knowledge and where mainly maybe Chinese factories or Chinese uh, Chinese chip foundries as we call it may may have a, a a competitive edge in this field of course you are not you know, you cannot easily uh, break the stranglehold on the on the super high power chips of the uh, five nanometer and smaller uh, that only basically taiwan semiconductor and 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 samsung can make uh, but you can try to diversify in this in this field and you can also create systems uh, that use 
chips that are not so high powered and that are not under the under the the, the embargo on uh, on on high end chip manufacturing design uh, uh, from uh, from the US. Yeah. So this is an evolutionary process, but it's a, the, the the key thing on the long term. Uh, it matters. The it it the the question is: Can China create the critical mass of for new innovation environments? And that's what we that was also the beginning of my talk: integrate the digital and the non-digital knowledge. And finally, uh, challenges and opportunities from COVID. Uh, well, the main thing is. Um, COVID, of course, has uh, reinforced the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the public and the government investment into infrastructure. This is why industrial internet was, or why the government set up this program, new infrastructure, and uh, industrial internet is uh, one, one key area of five. Uh, so public investment has been uh, has been increased, and also the efforts to create all these uh, all these these uh, environment and uh, all these uh, innovation environments. Yes, uh, the negative side I have to say is that um, after looking, especially speaking from the perspective here in Guangdong and from the from the export based industry which is still largely uh, low tech or maybe medium tech is the enormous success that Ch that china had and the enormous expansion that we saw in all kinds of consumer uh, 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 industries here in the wake of the pandemic last year yeah uh, when some industries like for instance the light the light uh, household appliance industry in shunde here make toasters or coffee makers or all this, they suddenly saw their orders from around the world jumping up by 600% in this in, in this area. Shunde reported 600% rise in orders. And this, well, this this finally, this uh, this this resulted in the breakdown of, uh, of the global container uh, uh, transport systems uh, and all the bottlenecks that we that we have now. The bad thing about this is it seems that this resurgence of the Chinese export model has also confirmed all the bad habits that are associated with it, uh, which is low wage labor, which is uh, 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 not really training the workers, uh, that's not retaining the workers. For instance, there was no such thing like, you know, like a, any any kind of uh, of short term uh, work, uh, short work pay or something uh, for the workers during the crisis so that they could stay in the factory. They had to go home. And then after that, the factories couldn't find the workers uh, and the bosses had to go into the into the village street and put out signs and say, please work for me. Yeah. So and, and these things uh, in this thing, uh, in this sense, I think COVID has really reinforced many of the bad habits and as everyone is so successful at this point uh, it's difficult to or it has become more difficult to talk about the, the necessary uh, modernizations and institutional changes like in the field of collective bargaining and even more so in uh, in vocational training Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Lucia, for sticking around for all of our questions. Uh, thank you again for your very comprehensive overview um, uh, of China's industrial internet, uh, as well as, you know, with plenty of the nuances and details also thrown in there. Um, uh, I want to thank all of our audience members for your active participation today. And uh, I look forward to hopefully having you back in coming years as this research project, you know, draws to, draws its conclusions out. So thank you again to Professor Boy Luce, and good afternoon, good evening, and good night to everyone else wherever you are. Thank you very much.